Good evening, church family. It is uh, great to be with you and uh, excited to end our Transform series. It has been great. Hopefully, uh, it has not been too much like a fire hydrant, trying to drink from a fire hydrant. Uh, maybe a little bit, but a little bit's okay because uh, there's been a lot of different material and quiet times. You know, this week, uh, instead of having a quiet time packet go out, uh, we wanted to give you time just to review uh, the last six weeks that we've had together, talking and delving into these different areas of our lives that we want to be transformed in. This week, uh, as you saw on Sunday, is Transformed Church, that we really want to be a church transformed. Individually, we want to transform, but collectively, corporately, we want to transform as well. You know, tonight, what we're going to do uh, in your family group, some of you I know are watching this prior to family group, and that's okay. And if you're doing that, I would just encourage you to take notes uh, and write down answers to the questions that we have uh, when we have breaks in the video. And uh, if you are watching it for your family group, you know, as I've been going to family groups around the Merrimack Valley groups, uh, I have noticed that, you know, watching a 25, 30 minute uh, video together is a little bit challenging when you're in family group and you want to talk and you want to connect and be open and be real. And uh, sometimes by the time the video is done, you are ready to end the meeting. And so I'm going to have times where you can pause the video. Uh, the questions will be on the screen and you can just have time to answer the questions and uh, talk with one another and then start the video back up and we'll continue on. Uh, but I am uh, looking forward to today's meeting together as we're talking about this idea of transformed church. I'm gonna put the video, uh, the, the uh, slides here on the screen and uh, we can get started. You know, this idea of transformed church, when we look in the scriptures, uh, probably one of the first places that we look is the first century church in Acts. In Acts 2, uh, 41 through 42, and in verse 46, uh, I want to dive into uh, just what they did. It says, those who accepted his message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. How inspiring of a day that would be. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. You know, as you break down this passage, I know we've read this passage for those of you that have been around the church many, many times. Uh, but, you know, as you look at this passage, it does give you a little bit of a definition of what the church needs to be. And as you circle different items here, you know, it says those who accepted the message were baptized. So, okay, we see we need to be baptized to be a part of the church, right? They devoted themselves to teachings, the apostles' teachings, and they devoted themselves to fellowship. So if we're going to be a transformed church, we got to do that as well. They ate together. I love uh, just talking about Food. I know Brian Dun Dunleavy did a, a communion for us in Merrimack this last Sunday, and he talked a lot about food and how food is throughout scripture. Well, they did it too in the first century church. You know, as you break down this passage, there are a lot of things, but I, I want to look at kind of the definition that you can come up with from the passage there in Acts 2. A church is a group of baptized believers who've joined together in a commitment to help each other fulfill God's purposes for their lives, that really this is God's design for the church, that, that it's not for our purposes, it's not for fun, although we're going to have a lot of fun, it's not for us to uh, find our spouse, although maybe that's what happens here, uh, it's not for our kids to have Easter egg hunts, although we may have some Easter egg hunts, I don't know about this year, but in the years to follow, and uh, th those will be very enjoyable, but it is for God's purposes for our lives, that God has a specific purpose for your life, for the church's life, and that he wants to use the church in a way to carry out the purposes that he wants to fulfill on this earth through us. What a phenomenal mission God has given his church. You know, as we look at the, the, today's lesson, really, it's broken up in a, in a few different questions. One is, why is the church the most important group 
on earth. And we're going to look at eight different reasons. So buckle in. We're going to go through them quickly. Okay. And uh, then we're going to be able to discuss this a little bit together. The first is the church is God's family. I love that we're a part of God's family. In first Peter one, verse three, it says, praise be to the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, that we are able to have this new birth and be a part of his family. In verses four and five, it talks about the inheritance, right? You don't get inheritance unless you're a part of God's family, that you are part of God's family. You know, we all grow up in different family structures and situations. Some of us feel like we didn't really grow up with a family. Others of us have very fond memories of our families. No matter where you're coming from in your background, God is inviting us to be a part of his family through the church. And that's really his vision for the church, to be his family. The second thing is it's the reason God created the universe. Now, this is a big statement that God created the universe for the church in order for us to point the entire world to the creator to help people get connected to him and be a part of the church family that we have. That's why he created the universe. That's why we have shows like Planet Earth on Discovery Channel or Life on Discovery Channel or the National Geographic. I don't know if you like that channel, but I love watching God's creation and all the detail that went into it. It's all been made in order for us to be pointed towards Christ. In Ephesians 1, four through five, it says, for he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy, blameless in his sight in love. He predestined us for adoption to sonship and daughtership through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will that before all of creation was designed, he had in his mind, the church. And so he created the universe with the church in mind that if he created the universe in this way, it was going to point people to be a part of his family. That's the second reason why this is the most important thing that we can be a part of on this earth. The third thing is God is using his church for his eternal purposes. You know, as we think about the purpose of the church, they are eternally relevant. They are eternally focused. They're not focused always on the here and now. Now they get things done. The church helps to solve community issues and deal with things. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later, but the real purpose is eternally focused. Ephesians three, verse 10, his intent was that now through the church, the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms, according to his eternal purpose that he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. He's saying that his intent for the church is eternally focused. And I love what it says here. It make, makes it a little bit easier to understand what he's talking about when it says the wisdom of God should be known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. What's he talking about that? He's talking about angels, right? Through Christians like yourselves, this is the message version, it says, through Christians like yourselves gathered in churches, this extraordinary plan of God is becoming known and talked about even among those authorities, those rulers, the angels, right, of the spiritual realm. This concept that even the angels want to peer in and look at the plan unfolding that God has designed through the church. The fourth thing, Jesus died for his church. If Jesus thought that it was worth dying for, we can sign on as of right now or show up after uh, we're out of quarantine or be a part of God's church family. And it is so much easier to be us than it was to be Christ dying for the church. He thought it was important enough to do that. We can ante up and give uh, our own time, our own energy, our own money, our effort, because he was willing to die for it. Ephesians 5, verse 25 and verse 27 says, Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her so that he might present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or any such thing that she might be holy and without blemish. When it's talking about this, you know, I, I, I kind of cut out some of the portions there, but it's talking about the husband 
and the wife relationship and how he wants that unity, that connection, just like husbands and wives and that Christ is the husband to the church, his wife, right? And through that, he gave up his life, just like us as husbands would give up our lives for our wives because we love them so much. He thought it was important enough to die for the church. If he thought it was important enough for that, this is the most important thing that we can dedicate our lives to and focus our time on. The fifth thing, it's the only thing on earth that will last forever. Our lives are going to come to an end. Our families, every member of our family is going to die eventually. Our bank accounts, they're all going to be burned up in the last days. It's not going to be like money is going to go with us to heaven, right? Your car, even if it's really nice and really fancy, it will burn up in the last days, right? Nothing in this world will last forever. And a lot of the things that we have won't even last our own lifetimes, right? That we, we are, can, can look at things as if this is what's really going to be stand forever or last forever. And in reality, in our lives, we even see how fickle those things are, whether it's money, our jobs, the things we can put our security in. But this, this will last forever. In Ephesians 3, verse 21, to him be glory in the church in Christ Jesus through all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Saying that this will never cease to exist. Look at this passage that encourages so many of us. This is in the context of him talking about when all is over, when it's all said and done, when we've all died and that God is coming back and calling us to heaven that those that have died before us will go up and we will meet up with those uh, that have already gone before us in the sky and enter heaven together. And he says, and so we'll be with the Lord forever, right? And so we will be with the Lord forever, that our lives are very just but a mist compared to the eternal destiny that we have with Christ. This is the only thing that's going to last forever. Everything else will cease to exist at one point or another, but not God's church. And the sixth thing, it's the only group Jesus said would succeed. You know, there were a lot of things that in the first century and groups and nations and people and revolutions that were trying to pop up all over the place. And they, some lasted hundred years, 200 years, some lasted one year or six months, but this is the only thing that Jesus promised it would succeed. Matthew 16, verse 18. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. No matter what the church is going through right now, whatever turmoil we see, the church will never die. The church will never fail. The church will succeed to the very end and overcome Hades. You know, as you think of the power of Jesus's statement here, it gives me so much hope that we get to be a part of a group. We get to be a part of a family that will never see an end. No matter what we're going through, no matter what kind of flaming arrows Satan can throw at the church, it will never destroy us. It will never destroy the church. Wow. It's amazing that we're able to be a part of something like this. I hope you feel inspired as we're going through these. You know, the seventh thing is it's the only group big enough to solve global problems. You know, we talk about changing the world and it's a reality. We get to partner with God to change the world, but not yourself, not just you. You are not powerful enough to do this, but when you link up with God's church, you can make a difference globally. So many of you have been around long enough to watch the impact of your life actually have global, global, not global, but global impact. In Ephesians 3, verse 20, now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. You know, we have visions and plans of our lives. He's saying, it's immeasurably more than anything that you're envisioning, anything that you could even ask. And I could ask for a lot. You could ask for a lot from God. He's saying, no, I, I'm able to do way, 
way beyond. I have a global vision for my church, not just this little community, puny, small little vision. No, he's thinking 7 billion, 8 billion people, large church. That, that's what he's thinking. He, he has a bigger vision than you could ever imagine. And you get to partner with him when you're a part of his church. Number eight, the last one here, the greatest privilege in life is to be a part of God's church. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We started off in verse one, or the first one, I mean, uh, talking about being a part of God's family. And we're wrapping it up as well with the same verse here uh, as we're talking about being privileged to be a part of his church family. We get to be his sons and daughters. Take a moment just to meditate on that. You get to be a son or a daughter of the Most High, of the Creator of all things. You get to take in His inheritance. You get to be a part of His global mission. You get to be a part of His feasts and His family gatherings and His family days. You get to celebrate all these things because of the privilege of being a part of his family, him calling you his own, you having his last name. What a privilege to be a part of his church. You know, these are just eight things. We could go on and on and on about why this is the most important thing you could ever be a part of, why this is the most important group you could ever be a part of. But take time right now to discuss as a group. We're going to look at these two questions here. The first one is, what part of the last year in quarantine has made it hard to remember these things about the church? What part of last year has taken your focus off of these eight amazing, powerful things that show us that this is the most important thing we could be, ever be a part of? And the second question is, any one of these particularly that is harder for you to remember? Is there any one of them that you look at, it's kind of worded weird, sorry about that, but any one of these that are particularly harder to remember, maybe through this last year or through this season of your life that you're going through, maybe it has nothing to do with COVID, but it's just a hard season in your life. What are the things from these last eight that we just talked about, these passages that we looked at, what are these things that we've got to allow ourselves to remember when we think about God's church, take time now to pause the video and discuss these things. Take as much time as you need. We'll be right here when you press play. If you never pause, this will be a pretty awkward pause. But if you did pause, it's great to have you back. The next portion here is a few of the many benefits of belonging to a church family. You know, the first is it will help me focus on God. Now, we've read a lot of passages, and so we're going to go through these five things quickly, but you could attach lots of passages to these things. In, in Acts 2, right, what we read, they were devoted to the apostles' teachings, right? They were devoted to the fellowship. Getting with a church family helps us and helps you personally focus on God. It helps me face life's problems. This last week has been a crazy week in the Maines family. Uh, having Savannah be in surgery, I want to share with the North sector. I know I already said this to the Merrimack Valley sector on Sunday, but we are so grateful for you. We're grateful for your prayers, for your generosity, for your meals, for your love, for your cards and gifts. You have been over the top, just loving and kind to us. And we are so grateful for you. But this is what the church is all about, is it's taking care of one another. It's showing Christ's love to one another, and it's helping us face life's problems. Sometimes facing life's problems, you know, we need comforting and we need encouragement. Other times we, we need to be dis discipled and challenged, and that we're facing life's problems because we put ourselves in those situations, and we need people to voice their concerns and challenge us in a loving, godly way. But whatever it's going to take for us to faith, face life's problems, I can't talk right now, faith, no, face life's problems, 
That's what God's church is all about. You know, the third thing is it'll help me fortify my faith. There's faith, right? It'll help me fortify, man, Lord be with me. Help me fortify my faith. As you think about your faith and the different attacks that Satan is trying to throw at you right now, he has got a plan in store for your faith. He's got a way to attack your faith that he knows if he can get your family or if he can get your children or if he can get your wife or your husband or if he can get you to uh, not feel secure in your finances or with your job, that he will be able to destroy you. And so being a part of the church family, we fortify our faith in a way that we're able to completely combat and shield ourselves from God's, uh, from Satan, rather, his schemes, and that we have God's shield around us, his family, that we're able to partake in this fortification of our faith. The fourth thing, it will help me find my place to make a difference. You know, all of us want to make a difference. Now, it may have been years ago that you were really dreaming about this and the, the craziness of life or the worries of life or struggles that have come up have caused you to go, I don't know if I'm ever going to make a difference. But we all have in our DNA, we all want to make a difference. God says, come and be a part of my church family. Allow me to help you make a difference. He gives us a place to make a difference. And it's not something that we have to come up with on our own, but we're able to follow Christ's example in this. And the last thing is it'll help me fortify my life's mission. As you think about the mission of your life, it can get convoluted what our focus needs to be. Christ is saying, no, 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 it doesn't need to be convoluted or distracted or misguided. No, I know the mission of your life that is going to bring you the most peace, the most joy, the, the, the greatest satisfaction. Come and be a part of my church and I'll help give you your life's mission. I'll give you direction. As you think about these five things, I, I want you to pause the video again and ask which benefits do you need to be more deliberate in using and thinking about and focusing on in 2021. As we go on through this year, what are the benefits, the five benefits that we've talked about here? I'll go through them again for you. It's, it will help me focus on God. It will help me uh, face life's problems. It will help me fortify my faith. It will help me find my place to make a difference. And it will help me fortify my life's mission. What are the benefits or benefits that you need to be more deliberate in using in 2021. Press pause now to be able to write those down in your notes or discuss as a group. Hopefully you had a great discussion and uh, you were able to at least write down some notes to have a discussion later if you're not watching the video with your group. Uh, but if you are, I, I pray that this was very, very helpful in your discussion. My prayer is that as we look at these benefits, as we really understand why the church is so important, that we would never allow Satan to distract us from being a part of God's transformed church family that we live in and are able to be a part of. I am so thankful for you guys. Let's finish out in a word of prayer. God, thank you. God is convicting as we're looking about why this is the most important group that we could ever be a part of, the most important thing that we could ever dedicate our time to, that we just came up with eight things very easily and we can come up with so much more, God, and yet that's not what we're always focused on with the church. The times we're focused on the things that are hard or the things that we don't like, uh, we're, you know, we're distracted by life's worries and maybe we don't, don't even think about the church. God, I pray that you help us to recognize all the ways that this is so beneficial in our lives to be a part of your church family. God, I pray that as Philippians 4, 8 talks about all the positive things that we need to be thinking about and meditating on continually. God, I pray that we can do that with the church. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I appreciate you being with us tonight. Hopefully this has been a helpful time of discussion and faith building connection. Uh, talk to you guys very, very soon. Love you. Feel very loved by you. Talk to you later. Bye-bye.